Good afternoon to you all. Um, thank you so much, Professor Feynman and Andres, for giving me the opportunities to make my findings and research public with all my colleagues. And I really look back to all your feedback. Um, thank you also to Emily Lavadi for organizing this session. I really appreciate that. And lastly, I want to thank all of you for being here. My topic is national prosecution for gendered international crimes. And I want to spend a little bit of time talking about my topic because it captures everything that I'll be talking about this afternoon. And that will also provide us with some context um, of what I will be talking about. So when we talk of international crimes, you're talking about crimes against international law. And these could be genocide, crimes against humanity, or war crimes. So I'm using the term gendered international crimes in courts because I'm looking at sexual violence that is committed during armed conflicts. And I asked the question in my research that does Uganda have the legal and structural capacity to prosecute gendered international crimes? I asked that question for, because of three reasons. The first one is that Uganda has a duty to prosecute international crimes. And that duty derives from customary international law, as in contemporary terms, also the Rome Statute of the International Criminal Court, through the complementarity principle, which in Article 17 is to the effect that the ICC can only seize jurisdiction if the state in question is either unwilling or unable. But in fact, I argue in my dissertation that states always have a responsibility, even where they are unwilling and unable. Why? Because the international criminal system is designed for the most responsible perpetrators, the chief architects of the crimes, and these are usually about a handful. So in the case of Uganda, even if we have thousands of perpetrators, the ICC only indicted about five, two are dead, one is not confirmed dead, so that leaves about two. So then the question is, what happens to all the rest? Uganda still has to prosecute those. And so the second reason why I ask the question is because Uganda has a problem with sexual crimes. And we shall see later on when I start to discuss Uganda, the situation in Uganda that, in fact, it has been, it has been undergoing a war for over 20 years. And it has lots of victims who are women and children of sexual crimes. So they need some form of justice and redress. Um, in answering that question, I examine the legal system in Uganda, which is domestic criminal law. I also examine the capacity of the institutions and a bit of politics, but not so much. It's mainly institutions and the legal capacity. But before going into the situation in Uganda, I would like to give a general context of the trends in international law. What are the developments in international law? How has rape been prosecuted in international law over the years? And what are the contributions of the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia, the International Criminal Tribunal for Rwanda, the Special Court of Sierra Leone, the ICC Statute, and the ICC? So as you see from these figures, uh, rape has been a fundamental part of war. It's existed for as long as war has. And you see that in any given conflict, we can expect uh, quite a significant number of sexual violence victims. And it takes different forms. It can be rape, it can be gang rape, it can be mutilation, like this woman here. And it's not uncommon for the victim to experience all the violations. And what is interesting about the rapes is that they are perpetrated by both friendly and unfriendly forces. So in World War II, you see the Soviet armies raping between 900,000 and 2 million German women. In contemporary terms, about 7,000 African Union peacekeeping troops are under investigation for sexual violence crimes. The United Nations peacekeeping troops have also been implicated. So it's a two-way street. And notwithstanding, the recognition of rape as an international crime has been painfully slow. And there have been attempts to prosecute rape 
even as far back as the 1300s, and we see a very controversial conviction in 1474, which did not get very far because it was a conviction based on rapes perpetrated in an illegal war. So had the, had the war been legal, then it should have been okay. But then you see calls to prosecute rape in the Nuremberg and Tokyo tribunals, which are very unsuccessful. And then fast forward to the 1990s, we have the ad hoc criminal tribunals, the tribunal for Rwanda and the tribunal for the former Yugoslavia. And there is a complete change of mindset. And I want to attribute this, this change to the events that were happening at the international level. You see that during that time, uh, the women's movement had just made major scores uh, in 1993 at the Vienna Conference. And women's rights had just been affirmed as human rights. And you also see that playing out in the way the tribunals are constituted. You see women judges, and you also see some form of activism on the bench. You also see women prosecutors, something that had been absent. So um, I wasn't surprised when I saw these kinds of developments coming out from the international systems, because I knew that uh, women's rights had become visible at the international level, and also the international community was ready that you know there was a presence of women's rights so the international criminal tribunal for rwanda was the first tribunal in the 1998 judgment of akaisu to find that rape was a crime against humanity now for any crime to amount to a crime against humanity it must occur in the context of either a widespread or systematic attack and in the slide I put and or because the Rome Statute, um, in a way, in a way suggests that it could be either or, even if the tribunals have construed it as something that must happen in both events. Okay, so you see rape being affirmed as a crime against humanity, as a crime against uh, as genocide, because you see that the tribunal argued that uh, rape had been a step in the destruction of Tutsi women. And there, were evi there was evidence that even if the attack was against Tutsi women, Hutu women who are married to Tutsi men were also targeted and raped. So which meant that they were a vessel towards the destruction of the Tutsi men or the Tutsi community. The tribunal also went ahead to define rape for the first time in international law as the invasion of a physical nature committed on a person under coercive circumstances. It also went ahead to define the concept of sexual violence. But most importantly, it, it explained the concept of consent, which is a major element of rape. And this was, was a major score because you see the tribunal saying that consent must be construed in the context of the violence occurring during war and the general atmosphere of oppression. And you also see the International Criminal Tribunal for Yugoslavia following this reasoning. And in the Foka and Voka appeal cases, in the first case, the plaintiffs appealed in the appeal chamber that the trial chamber had erred in law because it had adopted a definition of rape which did not include force. And in the second case, the Volcker case, they argued, the appellants, that the continued resistance is necessary to establish consent. The trial chamber, however, rejected both and established that force and continued resistance are not elements of rape. And we see this jurisprudence influencing the Rome Statute significantly. And now in, art in Article seven of the Rome Statute and also rule 70 of the rules of procedure, you see that they are in fact expanding the factors that might vitiate consent. And in Article 7 you find factors such as psychological oppression, abuse of power, probably because of the peacekeeping troops and the person that are supposed to be protecting, coercive environment, incapacity to consent. And rule 70 is particularly interesting because it indicates that you cannot infer consent from the silence of the victim, from lack of resistance, and from the character or words, actual words of the victim, even if they say yes, if it is in the context of war 
are oppression and violence. So now, there is no dispute under international law that rape is in fact a crime against humanity. And rape has also been established as a war crime. War crimes require a nexus between the act complained of and the armed conflict. And the reason for that is to distinguish armed conflicts from banditry, insurgencies, and sporadic acts of violence so that international humanitarian law can be triggered into play. And in the ICTY case of Furunziza, you see that uh, the ICTY relies on Common Article 3, which prohibits Common Article 3 of the Geneva Conventions, which prohibits the crime of outrage upon personal dignity. And the ICC interprets that to, to say that rape is in fact an outrage upon personal dignity and therefore a war crime. It lists three elements for establishing a crime a war crime, and those include contempt for human dignity and a nexus between the act and humiliation. And then the question is, what is humiliation? Humiliation, the test of what humiliation is, is whether the act causes suffering and degradation of the victim. And the tribunal found that rape was in fact a war crime on that basis. Now, the International Criminal Court changes and uh, departs a little bit from the position in the tribunals and splits the crime of rape and the crime of outrage upon personal dignity. And in Article 8, we see it establishing rape as an independent crime. And that is without, and that is of course with consequences because in the Bemba case, which is still in very preliminary case stages in the ICC, you see that uh, the prosecutor in that case attempted to charge the accused persons with both rape and the crime of outrage upon personal dignity. And under outrages upon personal dignity, the prosecutor listed acts such as gang rape, rape at gunpoint, ripping clothes prior to the rape, severity of the rapes, and rapes in public. But the trial chamber, pre-trial chamber, um, denied to confirm the charge of outrage upon personal dignity on the basis that those acts which I just listed were sufficiently covered under the charge of rape. So there's a bit of a problem because then if you cannot prove rape, there is now a legal vacuum, there is a gap. So which means if the accused person rapes clothes or threatens to rape you, and you cannot prove rape, you still can't prove the crime of outrage upon personal dignity. So then what are the current debates in international law? The main one is that, it's several of them, but the main one is that has Ray preached the, st the, the status of use Coggins? And the benefit or the advantage of construing rape as a benefit of use Coggins is that in accordance with Article 53 of the Vienna Convention on the Law of Treaties, there is no there is no requirement to establish a nexus between the rape and the armed conflict, as is the case with the crimes against humanity. Neither is there a case, uh, the need to connect the rape with a widespread or systematic attack. This is for the case of uh, crimes against humanity and the first one is for war crimes. Neither is there a need to ratify, you don't have to ratify in order to be responsible, for a state to be responsible. And in addition, crimes, rather, uh, norms of use Coggins invoke universal jurisdiction. And we have seen this being played out in several countries, notably Belgium, Canada, and the United States. We've seen several claims before the US courts on the basis that uh, the defendants violated norms of use Coggins. The first case is Siderman versus the Republic of Argentina. In that case, the plaintiffs argued that the, that the defendant had violated their right to freedom from torture. And the court, in fact, established that it did have jurisdiction over the crime because it was a, a norm of use Coggins. Torture had reached the status of use Coggins in international law. And the test that was established was that uh, use Coggins norm can be ascertained from the general international recognition that no derogation is permitted. And it also established that uh, Yuskogen's norm transcends 
consent, state consent, so you don't have to have ratified in the, in the case of uh, torture, you don't have to have ratified the Convention Against Torture, and besides, torture is now an, it's a hardened rule of customary international law. And also the third point, which was very important, was that the defense of state sovereignty did not apply. And so even if Argentina was a sovereign state, it could be tried in US courts, which was very important. But this, the second case, Kadik, is very important as well because it specifically addresses rape. And again, we see US courts saying that they have jurisdiction over, use of, over norms of use cogens and that sexual violence is indeed a norm of use cogens. So having said that, and having seen all those developments in international law, there are still some problems. And we find that uh, that record of these tribunals is mixed. You have both positive aspects and negative aspects. And I term the positive aspects as best practices, which I hope to borrow for the case of Uganda and the others as not so positive, negative, that Uganda should avoid when it comes to prosecuting these kinds of crimes. So the first one is that there was a general tendency to marginalize sexual violence crimes. And Akayisu comes to mind, and many other cases in fact. You find that in all those cases, sexual violence crimes were added, even in the first case of Akayisu, after the trial had already commenced and they were added by amendment of the charge. Archives is specifically imp interesting because during trial where they were tr trying the accused person, Akayisu, of genocide, the witness randomly testified about the rape of, a six -year of her six-year-old daughter, the gang rape, in fact. And one of the judges on the bench, a female judge, adjourned the proceedings so that the prosecution could investigate further and consider adding rape as a charge, which happened, and then we got this very remarkable judgment establishing rape as a crime against humanity and as genocide. The other problem is with the principle of superior responsibility. And I noted in the beginning that international criminal law is designed for the most responsible persons, the senior persons. Now, because these persons usually stop, usually stop at uh, making the command, it is very difficult to actually tie them to the actual crimes. And because of that, we've seen so many acquittals, especially when it comes to sexual violence crimes. And the tribunals have established a very high test, and they're now distinguishing between substantial influence over subordinates vis-a-vis -vis general influence and effective control. And they've said that what they require is effective control. And they've also said that the superior should not go out of his way to prevent crimes. He can only prevent that which he knows. So that is really very difficult. And it is even more difficult when it comes to civilian leaders. Now, Akaisu was a mayor, I would say a mayor, and I don't know if that would be a governor in the US context. I don't know, some civilian person. Would it be? Mm -hmm. Yes. And in the US, that would be like, Okay, yeah. So you try to hold a governor responsible for crimes being committed by the army. That's quite difficult. And had not one witness actually placed Akayisu at the crime, it was a hall where the rapes were taking place, the tribunal was finding extreme difficulty holding Akayisu responsible. So what have they done in the presence of these con limitations? They've tried to make use of the concept of the of joint criminal enterprise. And under that concept, they are holding superiors instead responsible as aiders, abettors, accomplices, which changes the game because, again, we want to see them directly responsible, like we do in the crimes against humanity, like other crimes which are considered more serious, such as murders, torture, and the rest. Then, on the positive note, we see we see the tribunals being very flexible with evidence and corroboration is not required. You do not have to, rec to corroborate the evidence of a sexual violence victim. Neither is evidence of previous sexual character relevant. And inconsistencies in testimony have been interpreted as, in fact, a sign of truthfulness. 
as the ICTY says that a victim who has experienced very traumatic experiences cannot be expected to recall every minute detail. And I think that is a very important development. And then you also have witness and victim protection mechanisms in these tribunals. And these provide counseling services, psychological services, social support with the aim of preventing revictimization of victims under the guise of criminal proceedings. So now I get to Uganda. As a general overview, the war in Uganda has lasted over 20 years. And it is a transnational war in the sense that it involves um, maybe five states, South Sudan, Uganda, the Central African Republic, and the DRC, four states. So what have been the major responses to this war? They varied over the years. And the main one has been counter-military insurgencies where you have militaries trying to force them out, and then you have the DRC trying to force them out. And then we've also had peace talks, which went on for a very long time, and finally broke down in 2008. And then you have the, some international responses, such as the ICC indictments, which indicted the top leadership. And then you have other foreign responses, like the United States passed the North Uganda Recovery Act in 2010 and mandated the White House to do something about the war, loosely speaking, to do something. And as of 2011, there are 100 US troops advising the states on how to apprehend the top leadership. So what is the substantive law in Uganda relating to sexual violence? The law applicable is the Penal Code Act, mainly. And it prescribes crimes against humanity, or excuse me, offenses against morality in Chapter 7. And those include rape, defilement, elopement, unnatural sexual practices, and prostitution. Now, the definition of rape is very narrow. It is strictly canon knowledge. And in Uganda versus Chamsungu Ivan, the High Court stated that rape cannot be established where there is no penetration of a male organ into a female organ. So which means that the, the, the other forms of rape cannot be recognized. And there's another case, but I will not discuss it, but it's in your readings. It's from Hire where a child um, describes the male organ as a tail, and the court has very difficult time trying to figure out whether that was rape or not. And in fact, they only do that after the child clarifies that she was in fact relating to the male organ. Then you have the law relating to consent, which is also very controversial. Section 123 of the Penal Code Act refers to consent in two respects. The first one is where there is no consent at all. And the second one is where the consent is obtained by force, threats, intimidation, fear, or false representation. Notwithstanding that the section is to that effect, the courts in practice almost exclusively use force as the dominating factor in establishing whether consent took place or not. And in those two cases, Makoba and Tumwesije, the High Court in both cases relied on the absence of injuries, which would be consistent with, the force, with force to establish that there was in fact consent and to acquit the accused persons of rape. Relating to evidence, the law applicable is the Evidence Act, and it applies to all proceedings before all courts in the country. And Section 59 establishes the rule of corroboration by stating that rape can only be proved through the oral testimony of a victim and other witnesses, or through medical evidence. And in the Katumba case, you see the Supreme Court affirming this position and justifying it by saying that rape does, that corroboration in cases of rape confirms that rape in fact took place and that it is the, the perpetrator that is responsible. Now they've established a rule of practice where they've said that in the absence of corroboration, this is a little bit flexible, that in the absence of corroboration, the judge has to warn himself and the assessors before convicting in the absence of corroboration. Now, this rule, although a little progressive and a little bit flexible, has been responsible for many 
overturns at the higher level and you find that many cases have been overturned on the basis that the judge did not warn himself or he did not even warn the assessors that there was absence of corroborating evidence. So then that leaves medical evidence as the most acceptable form of corroboration and that is done through what we call police form three. So the practice is that when a victim is raped, they go to the police station where they find a medical personnel, a government official, who examines them and fills the form. And that is the form that the police hands over to the DPP's office, Director of Public Prosecution, and that is the form that is adduced in evidence to establish rape. Now, the form has several issues. First of all, it's not always readily available. And then two, even if it's available, it's a cake. It asks questions such as, when was the hymen ruptured? You know, that sort of thing. And it makes no provision for the more innovative forms of rape. So it is not so helpful. So I find that to also be a gap in the law. And then lastly, you also have the issues with the character of the victim. Section 51 of the Evidence Act provides that previous good character of a victim is always relevant in the criminal proceedings. However, section 154 provides that the credibility of a rape victim may be impeached by evidence of previous immoral character. And that is a common law rule, which, which was to the effect, or which is still to the effect in some places that if the accused person can show that the victim had consensual sexual relations with them before, then perhaps that is an affirmation that they did consent to sexual relations this particular time. And another way of looking at it is that if the victim has been indiscriminate in her sexual encounters, then she most likely consented to this particular sexual encounter. So there have been reforms. Uganda has domesticated the International Criminal Court Act the international, the Rome Statute of the International Criminal Court by enacting the International Criminal Court Act 2010. And also the interna International Criminal Crimes Division has been established as a special division of the High Court. And the ICC Act adopts the definitions in the Rome Statutes almost verbatim, as well as the elements of crimes. So it's the same situation. But it does have some limitations. The first, that, the first is that it's limited in its jurisdiction and only has jurisdiction over crimes that were committed after June 25, 2010. And we are looking at crimes that span over a 25 year period. So it's going to be inapplicable in most of the cases. And we see that already playing out in the first case before the International Crimes Division. In the Coyello case, the Prosecution was severely limited, and you see that he depended, or the office of the prosecution depended heavily on domestic criminal law, which has problems, and also on common Article 3. Now, we just discussed about use Kogans and customary international law, and I'm of the opinion that customary international law would have been a good option for the prosecution. However, it is largely unknown in the Uganda legal system. And the judges also strictly construe the principle of legality. So it is very difficult to make a case on the basis of customary international law. But notwithstanding, the prosecution didn't even try. So maybe it would have been a first instance where the judges would have been enlightened. Secondly, there is politicization. And you see that only the rebels are being charged before this court even if the Uganda People's Defense Forces, which is the National Armed Forces, have also been implicated in these crimes. And most people think, and I think too, that these, the armed forces will be tried in the court martial and not necessarily by the International Crimes Division. So which again means that the court martial will, will rely on domestic criminal law and not on customary international law or the International Criminal Court Act. And then the other limitation is that there are competing forms of justice and the main problem stems from advocates for traditional justice mechanisms and the proponents are usually elders and leaders in the affected communities. 
they argue in favor of these mechanisms, which tend to be generic and are not very, very specific to any particular crime. So for instance, some rape victims and women who have been forced to undergo forced marriages have been, have been asked to step over raw eggs as a ritual of cleansing them. Others have been taken to the rape, the rape scene, those that remember, and they've had a goat slaughtered there. And that has, that, you know, that has mis mixed results. Some victims saying they feel a sense of relief and justice, while others find the whole procedure meaningless. So that also is hampering the, the operation of the court because those victims that want to pursue traditional justice mechanisms are not very cooperative. And then also there's an issue of reconciliation, specifically for sexual violence victims. Many of them remain married to the perpetrators. Some of them have had children with them. And for others, their families are not willing to have them back, so they are tied to these husbands. And then the other problem is the Amnesty Act, which was enacted in 2000 in order to, as an incentive for the rebels to renounce the rebellion. The Amnesty Act under sections three and four offers blanket amnesty to all who renounce the rebellion. So you have some hundreds of people who have already benefited from amnesty. And you see the problem that is going to pose for the International Crimes Division already in the Coelho case. Now, what happened in that case is that Coelho, the first defendant before the International Crimes Division, challenged his prosecution before the Constitutional Court. And the Constitutional Court agreed that his prosecution was unconstitutional because he did qualify for amnesty and the fact that other senior officials had benefit, benefited from amnesty, there was no reason why he shouldn't be granted amnesty. So right now there is a standoff with the International Crimes Division saying we do not recognize amnesty because this is an international crime. And the Constitutional Court, which is a higher court, saying that that is an unconstitutional prosecution. So that is where things are at the beginning. But the other effect of amnesty is that it inhibits private prosecutions by some of these victims who could have done that. And although the Amnesty Act does not specifically prohibit that, you see that in Article 28 of the Constitution, which says if someone has already been punished or someone has already been tried, you cannot try them again. And it also says that if someone has already been pardoned, you cannot try them again. And amnesty is a form of pardon, so again, there is a roadblock there for the victims. And then what about civil remedies? Yes, that is a good option. However, the victims, most of them are very poor and they cannot afford to hire private attorneys to pursue these. And also, even if they could, the perpetrators are destitute. They do not have any form of movable or immovable properties that can be attached in order to get some form of relief maybe, and for the sexual violence victim, perhaps that relief could have been used to take care of the children. So a woman does not have to worry about remaining married to the perpetrator because she can recover and get some form of child maintenance from the perpetrator if they could afford it. But then I'm thinking, and I hope to propose in my research that this this war has been funded by people who have money, like the government of Sudan funded the war for quite a long time. And then you also have people who are funding it from the diaspora. These are people who have money. So I'm, I'm thinking that perhaps this is an avenue, maybe a class action of sorts, where the victims could institute a suit and get remedies and reparations from these kinds of people and all the government of Sudan. And then the other structural limitations are the weak criminal system. Uganda does not have a witness and victim protection mechanism, which means that even if a victim was willing to come forth and testify, it's not quite possible because the war is ongoing and the victims are still living together with perpetrators. So it's very difficult in the absence of security. And then other structural limitations are that uh, the staff and the capacity of the court. Prior to the commencement of the first trial, one of the judges 
very strongly express dissatisfaction with the capacity of the court to prosecute these kinds of crimes. And then you have the issue of evidence for crimes that happened several years ago. Where is the evidence going to come from? How are they going to collect it? Okay, and then lastly, most victims have expressed some form of, uh, uh, most victims have expressed a favor for compensation from the government. However, the government, even if it has set up these mechanisms, has not set up a trust fund, which we see in the ICC, like the trust fund for victims, which could be used to compensate victims. All right, thank you so much for listening. <laughs>